So this is a walkthrough on um, how to install OpenStack Icehouse using RDO on Fedora 20. Uh, RDO is a project to uh, enable easier OpenStack deployment and management on, quote, EL-based distributions like uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Fedora, CentOS, and others like it. Um, so the what I've got here is a uh, brand new install machine uh, with a, uh, it's a minimal, Fedora minimal install with um, just the standard set of packages. So I'm gonna start from here and I'm gonna try to do as few cuts as possible so that there's no voodoo magic happening behind the scenes that you can see from, from the very beginning all the way up through um, deploying networks, which will be a focus of this demonstration because uh, Neutron is a little hairy and uh, you have to do the special incantations in just the right way. Um, the usability on that component is not quite uh, up to the usability of the other components, and so that'll be a focus in this demonstration is how to set up the software-defined networking um, for an all-in-one um, for an all-in-one deployment. So um, what I have here is a clean installation. Uh, first, we're going to do some uh, house cleaning things. Um, that uh, will save you some pain later on in the process. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to uh, disable Firewall D. Um, the reason we're going to do that is because OpenStack uh, really works with uh, works better with IP tables, and so Firewall D and IP tables are kind of integrated. And Firewall D does a lot of asynchronous stuff behind the scenes, and sometimes it gets in the way, and you have to open up ports both in the OpenStack environment and through Firewall D. So it's a bit, so I find it's easier just to disable Firewall D. Uh, the next thing to do is disable um, Network Manager. This is the same kind of thing where Network Manager is too smart for its own good. Um, in the OpenStack environment, and we'll try to auto configure your interfaces while uh, Neutron is trying to change things around, and you just don't want them interfering with one another. However, you do want some uh, basic network enablement, and so for that, we can enable the network service. Um, if we can type it right. Um, the, the other thing we want to do, and this is recommended on the RDO site, is to uh, turn off SE Linux. Um, SE Linux is really, it's not um, evil or anything, it's just that with how quickly OpenStack moves, um, the files that are in the RPMs and then the files that the OpenStack services access are constantly changing and it's very hard to keep uh, SE Linux policies up to date. Um, and so th there are uh, bugs cropping up all the time with Nova, for example, trying to access a file that's not in its SE Linux policy and, and, and then causing a problem in the framework that you have to dig several layers down to figure out why, why Nova's not working because it can't access this one file. So um, for, again, to save pain later on um, in the all-in-one, you know, try this out type situation, we'll just set the uh, SE Linux policy to permissive. Um, another thing we want to do is, um, while set and force permissive sets it for the current environment, if we want to make it persistent across reboots, we need to go into the Etsy SE Linux config file and change this variable from enforcing to permissive. Um, the next thing we want to do is uh, look at our network configuration. So this is this is my network configuration. Right now, ETH0 is configured via DHCP. DHCP is really not great for an OpenStack uh, deployment because uh, PackStack, what we will eventually use in a little while to deploy OpenStack, uh, looks up what your IP address is on the interface and then uses that in a lot of configuration files. So it's really important that that IP address not change. And so we are going to go in and set a um, static uh, IP address on this network interface. So we're going to go into the configuration file for ETH0 here, and uh, we're going to change the boot uh, protocol to static and uh, add a few fields here. So we need uh, IP adder equals, um, and just pick one that's outside your DHCP range. Um, you're actually going to need a whole bank of addresses outside the DHCP range for your network here in a little while. Um, but you just need one for, for right now. Um, 
that's the equivalent of it. You can use net mask uh, or prefix, which if you want to do it in CIDR notation or whether you want to do it in the old school um, net mask notation, um, set the gateway. That should be good. Um, so if you do an IF down on E0, IF up, E0, nope, oh, that didn't work. Let's just go ahead and reboot here. Sometimes I find that's the easiest way for your new network <laughs> settings to take effect. Um, it's hacky, but uh, it gets the job done in a hurry. So there you go. Now I got the E0 with our uh, static IP address there. Okay, so now that we have an aesthetic IP address, um, you can do a yum update, depending on what kind of installation you did. Uh, I did a netboot installation, which will install the latest packages, and so I don't anticipate that this will do anything for my situation, but you do want to have the most up-to-date packages before you uh, start this process. Okay, so there's no packages marked for update. Um, the next thing is to install the um, <clears throat> the RDO repository. So that's going to be yum install, and these lines are on the RDO website. I'm rolling the dice here, trying to type this in without typos. There we go. So as you can see, RDO uh, ice house repository was installed. Um, then from there, you can do yum install pack stack. Sorry, open stack pack, pack stack. And what pack stack is, is um, it's a little like uh, if you are familiar with dev stack, or any um, deploy installation tool for, for OpenStack components. Uh, Packstack is an installation tool for OpenStack components. And uh, it has an opinionated mode where it will just try to assume the components and configuration you want. But there's also, it can be customized in a ton of different ways. It takes a ton of command line options. Um, it just depends on how custom you want to get an installation time and then how much you're okay with just having it install with the opinionated options and changing those later. Um, so what I've found is a happy medium um, is doing um, pack stack with the all-in-one option, uh, which uses a bunch of opinionated options and then overriding a few of those opinionated options, um, namely not installing Solometer, um, which is a metering service for OpenStack, um, unless you're going to be billing tenants on your all-in-one, uh, which is not likely. Um, you won't be needing that. Uh, not installing Cinder, because um, block storage <laughs> in the all-in-one setup uh, involves uh, creating a file, then creating a loop device on top of that file, then creating a physical volume on top of the loop device, then a volume group on top of the physical volume, then logical volumes inside the volume group, and then iSCSI targets to go over the loopback interface to be, be mounted on your um, host system and then presented as disks in your guests. So for an all-in-one installation, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> so let's see if I typed all those in right. Um, it'll need a local root password. And as you can see here, a bunch of puppet scripts run to deploy all of the components of OpenStack. Now this takes quite a while. This will be the one cut in this demo. So um, I'll come back when this installation is done.
Okay, so now the uh, PackStack installation is complete. I have to be completely honest that I did run into a problem during installation. I had to back out. Um, the Rabbit MQ, MQ installation failed, um, and I will show you why it failed. Um, so as you can see here, my uh, my host name is openstack.localdomain. If open if the name OpenStack is not resolvable, um, then the Rabbit MQ server fails to start. Um, so what you need to do is uh, go into your Etsy host file and make sure that uh, you have a local resolve rule for your machine's um, name. And so here's our static IP address, the dot two hundred, and then OpenStack, and then OpenStack dot local domain. Um, and that allows the RabbitMQ server to resolve our host name, which apparently it requires to start up. Um, so now that we've got PackStack installed, um, if we look in our current directory, we see a couple of things. Um, also going back to the, to the failure, if you want to restart PackStack, you, you don't want to run it with the same options again because it's already started to install with certain properties. And so um, the way you do that is, um, this is actually good that this has happened because now you can see what it takes. So this command here, packstack dash dash answer file. When packstack starts, it's gonna generate a file that documents all of its opinionated options that it's using. Um, and you can use those, and some of those things are uh, generated on the fly, like uh, database passwords and things like that are just randomly generated. Um, and so once you've started it once, you wanna use those same passwords again because those services might already be installed with those passwords. And this is the way to start the process back up or make a change to the pack stack configuration after you've already run it once is to use the uh, dash dash answers file and like i said the all-in-one will generate that file for you um, so if we look elsewhere in the directory we see a keystone rc underscore admin file take a look at that um, you can see um, it has the uh, admin tenant uh, the username and the password uh, that it uh, that generated uh, just randomly uh, during the all-in-one install, and we're going to need that password later. So um, there's a bit of, after the PackStack installation is done. There's a bit of networking work to do um, to get the um, Neutron Open vSwitch uh, bridges to work the way we'd like. So if we do an IF config now, you can see that there's two new uh, devices here. We've got uh, BR-EX, which is the Open vSwitch external bridge, and then you've got the BR-INT interface, which is the Open vSwitch integration bridge. Um, the 10,000 foot view of this is the integration bridge is the um, bridge between your um, your OpenStack public network and your actual physical public network. Um, the open, the uh, integration bridge is the um, bridge that all of your clients will be connected to internally and they communicate with one another over that bridge. Um, so as you can see here, the external bridge has been configured with a 172.24.4.225. That is uh, a, a pack stack default, and it's probably your external network is not likely to be uh, on that subnet. So we're going to need to change that. Um, so we're going to we're going to need to change both the uh, external interface bridge and the uh, underlying uh, Ethernet port ETH0 to uh, work together. Um, so in order to do that, we're going to go into the um, let me just see the end of this entry. Into the external bridge configuration file. Um, and what you, you can see that IP address has been set here. You, what we're going to do is we're going to move our uh, static IP address from ETH0 to the bridge. Um, and then we'll just make ETH0 a port on this bridge. Um, and so I'll show you how to do that. Um, so we use the address that we've currently got configured on E0 and then change the net mask here. Um, 
set the gateway. And the DNS server. Okay. Now we go into the configuration file for ETH0 and uh, we're gonna rip out a lot of this stuff. So we're gonna change the boot protocol to none. Um, we also change the type of this device we, uh, to OSV port. That uh, indicates to the network configuration scripts that this is an adapter that is going to be added to an OSV bridge, uh, namely the, the external bridge. Um, and so we're gonna tell it to do that um, in network manager speak right now. So the device type is OSV, that's OpenV switch. The type, uh, we've already got that. The, we also need to specify which OSV bridge this is going to be attached to. And that is VREX. Okay. Then we are going to, uh, just for safety, rip out a lot of this stuff here, leave the name, IP address. We don't want an IP address on the uh, interface anymore. So these are the required fields here. Um, let me double check this with my notes. So we backtrack as little as possible. Okay. So, uh, so that uh, configures the interfaces. Well, obviously that hasn't taken effect yet. We're going to reboot to have those changes take effect because it's too hard to clean them up. Um, one thing we want to do before we reboot, though, is to uh, make a change to the OpenStack dashboard configuration. Um, I'm really not sure why this isn't the default, but uh, by default, the allowed hosts are only, it only allows uh, connections to the Horizon dashboard from the local machine. Um, I find that it's better just to, especially if you're not, you're not worried about security and you just want to get it to work at this point to uh, just open that up to everyone with this, uh, using the asterisk, the wild card that captures all. Um, so we're, uh, now we're gonna reboot and uh, that will cause our network configuration scripts to you know, reconfigure the interfaces the way we said. And it's also gonna, uh, has the side effect of restarting the uh, Apache daemon which will cause that allowed hosts change to take effect. Okay, now if we bring this up, you see that um, the external bridge didn't come up with the interface. Uh, well, sorry, didn't come up with the IP address that we configured for it. And this is a bug in OpenV switch right now. Uh, that bug is linked in the video description below. Um, hopefully it'll get a result pretty soon. The way to work around it for now is to take both the external bridge and the underlying interface down and then do an IF up on the underlying interface. And this will bring up both the external bridge and the underlying interface. And now you can see that the bridge is configured with the IP address that we had specified in the configuration file. It's really weird. Hope they get it fixed uh, soon. Okay, so, uh, and one thing to do, because the interface didn't come up with the IP address that we configured, there's the possibility that um, some of the OpenStack services failed to come up. So you want to check the status and uh, pack, uh, not pack stack. Well, the, the OpenStack RPMs uh, included with RDO have a pack stack status command that's really handy for seeing uh, what the um, status of all the OpenStack services are. So here we see that rabbit in queue failed. Um, so let's start it back up. So now it's back up. And you can see that uh, all of the services that aren't disabled on boop are now active. And so we should be good to go. Um, so from here, we're, uh, I'm going to switch to um, a browser interface and we're going to try to go to the OpenStack dashboard. So now we're, we're logged into the Horizon dashboard 
for the um, OpenStack installation we just did. So in order to log in, um, we log in as the admin user and then come over here and we do, um, this might get tricky, but we cut the uh, admin file here. Um, let me see how to do this with the demo. So we'll pull that up a little bit and again, roll the dice trying to type this in without typos. Once we get in once, we can change the admin password so that you don't have to remember these, this auto-generated one. Um, okay, sorry for the cut there. Uh, I had my cookies too restrictive on my browser and it was causing problems. So we're now logged in to the OpenStack dashboard. So from here, it's all uh, nice GUI stuff. So we can go through the, uh, so you've got two tabs here on the side. You've got project and then you've got admin. Um, there's so many components now that uh, in Icehouse, this has been a change that used to just go all the way down the side, but now they've got a collapsible menu system. Um, if you go to networks, you can see the networks that um, OpenStack, uh, or sorry, PackStack set up for you by default. Um, and these are not necessarily appropriate for your network. <clears throat> so we're going to have to uh, uh, change these. And in fact, uh, in this demo, I'm going to tear them down completely so that you can see how to build it up, build it from the ground up. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, delete all the, um, all the routers and all the subnets. Sorry, the, the networks, including their subnets. So we just click here, it selects all the networks, hit delete network. Okay, and so now we our network is um, completely torn down. We can rebuild it from the ground up just to solidify the concepts. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is create um, uh, the public network, uh, which can only be done from this administrative panel here. The tenants can't create the external network. The, the administrator has to... And then from inside the project, you create your private network and then the router that connects your private network to the public one. So here in the admin panel, we're going to create the public uh, network. And you want to select it uh, for the admin project, since that's who we're logged in for. We'll uh, create it for the admin project. And uh, we want to make sure we check this box down here, external network. And that that is going to indicate to Neutron that... Um, this network is the network associated with the external bridge. So now we've created the public network. We can go into the network and see the subnets and the ports here, which there are none. We need to create a public subnet. Um, this is going to be um, basically your pool of uh, floating IP addresses that are appropriate for the link that the external bridge is connected to. So um, in our case, that is the... 192.168.100 subnet. Um, now our external bridge has uh, the dot 200 address. So let's uh, let's make the gateway on this one 100.201. Again, this should be outside the DHCP range of the DHCP server on the external network. Um, Come here. We don't want uh, we don't want to have DHCP enabled on here because it's likely that you have a DHCP server already on your public network. Um, allocation pools is basically this is really going to be your pool of floating IPs um, for your guests. Um, so we're going to create a pool from uh, 200 is the external bridge. 201 is the gateway. So we want to uh, well, we'll start at 202 and go to 220. Um, and then we'll just use the, the Google DNS server for because I know that that will work from whatever network you're on as long as you're connected to the internet. So we create that and uh, now we've got our public subnet. So now if we go into the project um, and then go to the network uh, collapsible menu we can go into the network topology and you can see that public network that we just created right here. 
So we're going to um, extend that network uh, within the project by creating a private uh, network for this admin tenant. So um, we created the private network. Uh, now we're creating the subnet. This can really be uh, any non-routable um, address class. We can just use the 10 dot um, in this case. We'll do a, And then here, we do want to enable DHCP on this network because um, we're going to need to assign addresses to the guests on the private network. Um, so here, um, the gateway is dot one, so let's start at dot two and uh, go up to 20. And again, just use the Google DNS uh, and then create. So now we've got our private subnet and it appears in the network topology there now too. Um, now we need to create a tenant router to route traffic between the private and public network. So this actually has shockingly few options, just the router name um, to create. So we create a router. Now that router appears between the subnets but not connected to the subnets. So now uh, if we go in here, you can either roll over router and go to view router details or the more reliable way you can go to routers and then click here. Um, click on the router and you can see interfaces here. Um, what we want to do, actually back up a little bit, we'll set the gateway first. So when you set the gateway for the router, you want it to be the public network. And really, you, you can see that our private network doesn't appear in this list. And that is because it is not set up as an external network and therefore can't be the gateway for the router. Um, so we only have one choice there and it's public. Now when we do that, if we go back to our network topology, you can see that our router is now connected to the public network and has an IP address uh, 202 on the public network. The next step is to connect the private subnet to the router as well. Um, we do that by going to the routers tab, open up the router, go to add interface and select the private subnet. And then um, we want the router to be the gateway address that we set up. So 10.1 and we add the interface. Now, it's gonna initially show up as down, it'll come up in a little while. The external gateway interface always shows up as down for some reason, I'm not really sure why that is, but it's not down, it, it does work. Um, so now if you go back to the network topology, you can see that we've got our complete network topology here. We've got the private subnet, we've got the public subnet, and then the router connected to both of them with the gateway address for the private subnet and then an IP address on the public network as well. So after that, uh, we want to go in and set up our security groups. Um, there's a default security group already set up. Um, what I do is just delete all of the rules that already exist. And then um, to, to prevent having to mess with the security, again, this is an all-in-one, you're probably just trying things out, I just open, open it all up. So. Um, to all ICMP, you have to do all, all protocols for ingress and egress. So UDP, and then add same for all protocols on the egress side. Okay, so that should let all TCP, UDP, and ICMP traffic in and out of our guests. Uh, the next thing to set up is our um, pre-shared keys. So if we go to the key pairs tab here, we can go to import a key pair. Now what we want to do is um, I have a uh, SSH terminal into this into the um, the OpenStack server here, and what we can do is generate a key pair. So it actually tells us how to do it right here with the uh, with the key gen RSA. So we're going to do that right here, and I'm just going to go with no passphrase. That way it doesn't ask you. And 
After that, we've got Cloud Key and Cloud Key Pub. So we want to um, paste the contents of Cloud Key Pub into the public key blank here. And I'm just going to call it Cloud. Okay, so now we have our key pair. And uh, one thing we want to do in the admin tab is uh, go to the flavors. Um, these are the default flavors that come with OpenStack. Um, some of them are very inappropriate for an all-in-one installation, most likely with uh, you know 16 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, what I like to do is just clear out all the default flavors and then um, create a default flavor of my own. Um, with four, and we'll go with 512 megabytes of RAM and a 10 gig root disk, uh, no ephemeral disk, and uh, maybe a one gig swap, and then create that flavor. Oops, zero. Okay, and that's uh, an appropriate size for the size box that I'm running this demo on. So after we've set up our flavors, we can go into the project tab and go to instances, sorry, images, um, and see that uh, Packstack has already imported for us a Cirrus image. Um, it's a very small, limited uh, VM image that's uh, kind of a proof of concept to make sure that uh, when you spin it up, you can, do, you can have the network connectivity that you um, expect. So um, we can just go to launch here now that we've got everything set up. Um, give the instance a name. Everything else is already filled in. We've only got one flavor, which is our default flavor. We've got the image, Cirrus. Um, under access and security, it's already selected our cloud key pair that we set up earlier, and that's the only one we have, so that's the one it's selected. Um, under the networking tab, this is kind of unique. Um, it puts our subnets here, and we click and drag um, from the available networks into the selected networks box. Um, if you want to make your VM accessible on the public subnet, the way to do that is to associate it with the private subnet and then associate a floating IP with it after the instance has been started. So uh, I'll demonstrate how to do that. Um, so we just click launch and OpenStack will go about um, copying the image out of the Glance repository to Nova and then Nova will interact with all the virtualization technologies to spin up the VM. You can see here that it has pulled an IP address out of our private subnet to assign to this test VM. Shouldn't take too much longer here. And now we're up and running. The power state is running. If we go into the instance here and then go to the log tab, we can see it's boot log here. And you can see that it's coming up. Uh, we can click on full log and basically get a console dump from this, uh, from this VM as it's booting up. So as I refresh it, it's coming up, generating the SSHD keys, and you see now it's, at the, now it's at the login prompt. So obviously this is just a text document and you can't log in here. Um, so uh, if we go back to instances, um, we can go to access and security and then the floating IPs tab and say allocate IP to project. And we've got the public pool of subnet, uh, subnet addresses here, not subnet addresses, IP addresses. We say allocate IP and that gives us one of the um, public IP addresses from our public subnet. And then we click associate and then select test. This is the VM that we just created. And this is going to create kind of a, an alias um, associated with this private subnet address and the uh, traffic sent to this address will be forwarded from the external bridge to the integration bridge and sent to this VM. So now if we go to the instances um, we can see that there's now two addresses associated with the instance um, and one of them being the public IP address. So now if we um, come back to the demo window here um, and this is the this is our all-in-one installation, and uh, we 204 we SSH using the cloud um, key that we generated, and then the default uh, login name for the Cirrus VM is Cirrus, and we do the IP address.
and now we're in. We're into the VM. Um, we can see that if we do an IF config from within the VM, the only IP address that we see configured on the interface is the private one. And that's because the, the public IP, uh, the floating IP, as the name suggests, floats around and is really the, the instance is really not aware of what its public IP address is. But the network infrastructure is and forwards traffic to the floating IP address to the associated VM. Um, so that's about it. Um, we got You can import more images and uh, try different stuff out, but this is the basic setup. Hopefully this was useful.